Welcome into the College Football Overtime Podcast. My name is Garrett Chapman. His name is Abe Gordon. We got a lot to get into. Week three of the college football season has come and it has gone. And we have a lot more information that we need to dig into. Uh, is Georgia not the team that we thought they were? Or was it just a hiccup? Texas loses a starting player, a very important starting player. We got to talk about that injury. LSU escapes South Carolina. Missouri passes its first test. And we have some trouble down there in the Sunshine State. We're going to get into all of that here on the College Football Overtime Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, if it's your first time, welcome. If it's not your second, if you're second, third, why aren't you subscribed yet? Make sure to drop a like. Make sure to follow along all season long. Abe Gordon, Garrett Chapman, we are going to be talking college football right here on the College Football Overtime Podcast. All season long, but we got a lot to get into, Abe Gordon. But before we do that, got to welcome you in, man. How you doing? I'm doing good, Garrett, man. And another week of results. Nothing overly surprising, but a couple of headlining stories nonetheless. Uh, oh, yeah. So let's go ahead and break it down, brother. Yeah, we got to start with what's going on down in the Sunshine State. Both Florida State and the University of Florida, they play each other at the end of the season. And the unfortunate reality is one of those two teams is going to have to win that football game. Uh, Florida loses to Texas A&M. They get absolutely pummeled in that one, 33-20. Marcel Reed. Uh, I want to talk about the winners first because Texas A&M on offense looked like a completely different team. They looked really strong with Marcel Reed under center. Um, they, I mean, he comes out, he, he's running the ball, he's throwing the ball effectively. He accounts for several touchdowns. And and look, they just looked good. And I don't know if that was just the, the case of you're playing a, a physically and mentally drained Florida team, but Texas A&M did look pretty solid. But Flipping over to what's going on with the University of Florida, it is 2.09 in the afternoon. I still have not seen official news that Billy Napier has been fired as the head coach of the Florida Gators. And look, I'm never going to cheer for somebody to be fired. I, it's always a sad thing. It's not something that, I, that I'm happy about at any point for the most part. But this is a necessary thing for the University of Florida. They need to move on from Billy Napier. It's clear and obvious that it's not working. Fans are all over it. Uh, the media, I, I have no idea what his saving grace would be at this point. Well, the buyout, the buyout's always the saving grace. You can start there. And, Twenty-seven and, and, million dollars. And, and let me let me correct you on some. It, it's not always sad when someone gets fired. It's sad when someone like you and me, at, at the price range that we are, uh, trying to squeak out a a living wage, gets fired. Uh, when someone's getting $30 million to be fired, I'm not exactly going to spill any milk or cry some tears over it. Yeah. Uh, so I'll correct you on that. I, I, I look, Flo Florida is obviously, um, and, and this was the concern to start the year, if we're going to be honest, but um, they, they don't have any answers. Uh, Billy Napier has zero answers. And, and it's it's defensively, it's offensively, it's across the board. He has no answers, and they're they're losing the fan base, which doesn't take long, um, really, for any top top school top program to do it. You know, it, if you're not winning; it's going to go away pretty quickly. Um, it's just a matter of time, Garrett. I, I, it's obviously didn't happen this morning. I know there was some thoughts there, and you're, you're looking at the buyouts and other specifics that maybe are holding up the deal, and boosters have to get involved and garner support and in the, the big thing in florida is is the conversation regarding the ad um and, and whether or not he's yeah. going to be kept as well and, and that certainly is going to complicate things also um but there's just no answers on this florida roster and, and it's only getting worse uh in, in regards to the upcoming schedule so um yeah we're we're, we're just gonna have to kind of sit and wait through it until they actually decide to um, make that move. DJ Lagway, potentially the saving grace of the Florida program, struggled quite a bit in this one. Mm -hmm. And that's not a surprise, right? You know, he's a freshman. First, first SEC game as a freshman. And yeah. um, I, if I were Napier and I had any intention of, of coaching next year, I would continue to play Lagway um, and, and hope to get some of these mistakes out of his system and, and get him learning and on that mm -hmm. path. Um, be, because next year you don't want to be in week one, week two, dealing with some of those young mistakes. And then on the Texas A&M side of things, um, obviously Connor Wegman, uh, ruled out late, uh, on Saturday and, uh, Marcel Reed, as you mentioned, immediate touchdown drive in, in the first time that the, uh, Aggies had the ball. 
uh, gets it done with his legs, gets it done with his arm, uh, settled in very nicely uh, as a freshman, redshirt freshman getting the start. Yeah. Um, and interesting to see where they're going to go. I, I still don't think they're, um, you know, contender worthy, um, not not even in terms of championship, but just in terms of the playoffs. I, I don't think they're at that level, but uh, maybe a little bit more promising than what we've seen uh, under Wegman thus far. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they, they look pretty solid. I mean, Marcel Reed, buck 78 and two touchdowns for him, but he it was more just the, what he was able to do with his legs. Um, I mean, he broke off a 31-yard run at one point, finished the game with 83 yards rushing. And, and I mean, look, he just looked like he has a little – he's just a little bit more dynamic, you know, and he can do a little bit more, looked a little bit more comfortable. Um, but, I mean, Texas A&M, I think they are what they are at this point. I, I don't necessarily buy them as a legitimate – contender in the sec but we'll see what they can end up doing down the stretch um but for the florida gators uh, you mentioned the schedule and how like they're just now getting into the tough part tough, tougher part of the schedule this these are the two games that they were supposed to win if they were going to win any games really in the sec because you have texas a&m at home and then you're on the road at mississippi state those are the two winnable games really because then it's ucf which they just pulled a rabbit out of a hat and then a crazy game against um against tcu which i told y'all last week i mentioned it last week make sure you're tuned into that one that was gonna be a wild one uh but then it's it's tennessee and it's kentucky and it's it, it's georgia texas lsu Ole miss and florida state and i guess florida state's theoretically a winnable game based off of the way they've been playing and we'll talk about them here in just a second but i it's, it's just i don't see of the light at the end of the tunnel anymore that because billy napier was brought in here to be a strong recruiter, he hasn't really done that at a high level. He was brought in here to be a strong X's and O's coach. He hasn't done that at a high level. And, and look, he's pulled in some some recruits. Don't get me wrong. I mean, like he's he's a fine coach when it comes to the recruiting aspect of it. But it just hasn't shown up on the field. And it's just sort of the reality of the situation uh, for them down in, in Gainesville. But I do want to talk a little bit more about Tallahassee, what's going on in Tallahassee. Uh, did you have anything else that you wanted to say about this before we move I, on? I, I mean, I, I do slightly disagree. I know you cleaned it up a bit. I, I do disagree about uh, the good recruiting stuff. I, I actually um, think he's a very good recruiter. I think the program is not a top 10 program, and that's why you're not going to lock in top five classes. But, sure. um, you know, outside of that, no. I mean, he's he's very clearly not getting it done. The program's not taking steps forward. The, mm -hmm. the answer is obvious. We all know where this is headed. Yeah, and it, it's just an if. It's, it's not a, it's not an if it's about yeah, when of course. it's going to happen. Uh, but one thing that's probably not going to happen is uh, what is the status of, of Mike Norvell at Florida state? I don't think anything is going to happen, but I did text you during the game. I said, how warm is that seat? And uh, what did you say the buyout was? I think it's like 65. It's like 65 million, 62, 65, somewhere in there. If they wanted to, they'd find a way if they of wanted course. to, but I don't think that that's necessarily going to be the issue, but there, there are, a lot of issues here at Florida State. This is a a brutal situation here for them. They lose, of course, to the Memphis Tigers, which in a vacuum is not a terrible loss. I mean, Memphis is actually a pretty good football team, but 20 to 12 and in the way that you do it. DJ Uyunglele, he looked hapless from under center. He does get over the 200-yard mark, but they just cannot run the ball. They can't run the ball, Abe. They, they finish this game – with 37 total rushing yards. That was supposed to be the strength of this team. You were supposed to be able to lean on a rushing attack that was going to be able to prop up DJ, DJU just a little bit, or at least enough that they were going to stay in a lot of these football games. The rushing attack has been downright dreadful. A disaster. I mean, Lawrence Tofili, he had four carries, only 30, he only had 30 yards. I mean, you only run the ball 24 times total in this game because you don't have anything going on offense at all. There's no rhythm. They don't mesh well with each other. It's been a disaster for Mike Norvell. They're 0-3 for the first time in – I don't even know the last time they were actually 0-3. It might have been uh, Mike Norvell's third or second season. I, th I know they started 0-2 that year, but I don't know. I think I don't think they finished 0-3. I have to look it up and see when – the last time Florida State was ever 0-3, if ever. Yeah, I, I'm going to be honest, Garrett. I think we've been overreacting a little bit to Florida State. Um, 
it, it only because the expectations were nonsensical to begin with, right? Like the top 10 thing was, was a, a terrible decision by the voters. Um, you lose the quarterback that you had last year. And I, I get, he's not, you know, getting it done in the NFL right now. Um, but, but he was a very clear captain and leader of that team. And, and so important to the offense, you lose two receivers, uh, to the NFL, uh, although Keon Coleman did absolutely nothing for my fantasy team this week. Um, you, you lose, uh, two NFL prospects along the defensive line. Like, like this was not a team that is Georgia or Ohio state that can deal with those losses. Um, to, to think that this team was going to come in and be a top 10 team and light the world on fire and win this conference w- was nonsensical to me. Um, I, I actually think Florida State looked decent in the second half yesterday. Um, but you, you had three turnovers. You're just not going to beat good teams, not great teams, but good teams. Yeah. And Memphis is a good team. Good. Um, yeah. You're not going to beat them with three turnovers. I mean, the first play of the game, you ran the ball, you fumbled. And Memphis almost immediately scored after that. Um, and there were a couple of others throughout the rest of the game as well. And so, you know. The, the I, I if anything I thought I saw some improvements from Florida State I do think DJU kind of was able to get the ball down the field a little bit in the second half I, I do think Florida State took a big step forward um stopping the run in this game they only allowed uh, what 65 yards to Memphis that was one of the big issues they had had in losses yeah. to to Georgia Tech and Boston College uh, maybe a little bit of small steps forward but there's tough to see that right when you're losing a home game to Memphis. And I completely understand that. That being said, I told you that I liked Memphis in this game. Uh, I, I, I just think him. that – You picked him yeah, out. I think, I think Memphis is being overlooked in this one. So I'm not surprised by the result. Um, but <laughs> if, if there's anything to hang your hat on for Florida State, uh, that, that would be frustrating. I think you hit on it. Mm-hmm. The inability to run the ball – um, against a team like Memphis is, is inexcusable. Um, DJU's not great. Um, like I said, he was better in the second half. Um, but you've still got Florida State offensive linemen. You need to be able to get out there and push Memphis around a little bit and to run yes. the ball for, what did you say, 37 yards when you factor in uh, the sacks uh, that, yeah. that DJU took. Um, th- that's just not getting it done. And, and, and if I were going to look anywhere and, and here's the other thing, cause I was getting a couple texts, um, yelling at me about like, why won't they bench DJU? If you watch the game, like really watch the game and you see how bad the offensive line is getting beat and you see how little help DJU is getting from his receivers. Yeah. He's not the solution, right? He's not the answer, but he's also not the problem. Um, it, it goes well beyond DJU, and we've seen Brock Glenn, the backup, a couple of times last year. He's not the answer either. Um, it, it stems well before beyond just quarterback play there in Tallahassee. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 they have not been the same football team and it, since Jordan Travis got hurt. That broke that team. And I hate to keep harking back to, to that injury and, and the way it derailed that team. Abe, they have not accounted for a 300-yard performance since Jordan Travis went down. Since that injury, they have not done it. That's six consecutive games. I, I saw someone on Twitter as one of the uh, 24-7 sports reporters. He said he, he went back all the way to where uh, football reference was like calculating a lot of the total yardage or whatever. He went all the way back to the beginning of his service, and he never saw it. So as far as we know, it has never happened in Florida State history that they have failed to account for 300 yards of offense in six consecutive games. It's just an incredible thing. I, I, the way that they have just fallen off in, in, in such a, a massive way. I did not see them as a top 10 team. I shared that sentiment with you. We, we both thought that. But I didn't expect them to be quite this bad. I thought that they would start 3-0. and I didn't think that they were a top 10 worthy team. But to lose these games and in the way that they are losing them too, it's hard to really draw any positives at all. I, I just don't see anything good that's happening in Tallahassee right now. And I'm looking up and down the schedule, and I'm not trying to bury them or, or throw dirt on them or necessarily, but I, I mean, I'm looking here at this schedule, and it's like you have a trip to California up next. Um, or that's maybe, a home game. Yeah, it's a home game. So it, it is. It is at, at, at back in Tallahassee. Um. I mean, you should win that game, but that's a team that just beat 
Auburn. It just it's you a, still have a six. Look, I'm looking at the schedule too. There, there's still six wins on the schedule without any should be. real surprises. Yeah, I mean, there should be. Like, you should beat SMU. You should beat Cal. You're not beating Clemson. You should beat Duke. I mean, my, you're not beating Miami. You're not beating Notre Dame. I mean, it's it's just. I thought we were at a level with Florida State at the very least that they were going to be. They would have a puncher's chance in every game that they played this year, at the very least, if not be the favorite. This is the type of situation where I'm looking at this team. I don't think they have a puncher's chance against Notre Dame or Clemson or Miami. I don't know how you say that when 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 Northern Illinois just walked in there and took care of business. Like I I don't know. Yeah, I I think that was just it was a sleepwalking Notre Dame team. It it doesn't matter. Like we we've seen that they can be beat by inferior competition. I think that's a wild statement to make. I, I you saw how they responded. On Saturday, they just dropped 66 points on Purdue, Abe. That, that's is a team that, that they woke up, and that's – and look, Northern Illinois is also a pretty good group of five team. That's a solid football team. They're okay. I mean, let's not make them out to be some some group of world beaters either. They're not. They're right there. They're not the Memphis. Ilk. They're made of the same ilk as Memphis. Yes, they no, they're not. Right there no, they're not. They're in that same category. I completely disagree. Okay. I think, I mean, I think Memphis is going to threaten to get into the playoffs. I don't think Northern Illinois is. Fair enough. Fair enough. But things are not very good over there in the Sunshine State, and, and things are not set to get better anytime soon. Let's move on here to uh, another game that was kind of a surpriser. Um, well, to most people, I guess, and to me specifically. I thought Georgia was going to go in there and roll. But this has been sort of a house of horrors for the University of Georgia. Kentucky, the last three times they've taken trips up there, they have failed to get a, the surpass that 20-point mark. Uh, that's the only three times. It has happened for Kirby Smart, where he goes on the road and uh, fails to account for 20 or more points. All three of them happened at the University of Kentucky, 2020, 2022, and now 2024. He is still 3-0 and in those games, and that's the impre- most impressive part about that. But look, Georgia did just enough, and that's, at the end of the, the day, that's really all you need to do. Uh, Trevor Etienne was solid in this game. He, he wasn't spectacular. But he was solid. He was what you needed him to be. Carson Beck, I expected him to take a, a I don't know. I, I I he didn't look like that Heisman trophy level quarterback in this game, but I will say this though. Brock Vandegrift, he nearly willed the Wildcats to this game. He very nearly willed the Wildcats to a win in this game. But Georgia still is not allowed a single touchdown on the season, even if they allowed a field goal in all four quarters. Uh look, this is just it's an ugly performance but you got what you need when it mattered most and, and georgia showed resilience and that's important yeah i i, I mean the, the, a couple of things jump out to me and, and it's not just etn it's it's the whole running backs and the offensive line um which I, everyone keeps telling me they might be one of the best in the country and, and they might be but they're not getting it done in the run game uh they barely crack 100 yards in this one um, Kentucky outrushed them by 70, 68 yards, whatever the number is. Um, and, and thank, thank goodness. And I don't know what Brock Vandegrift is thinking of some of the mistakes he made. You talk about trying to will them to a victory. I think he partially handed it over to Georgia on a silver platter with some of the mistakes that he made as well. Mm-hmm. So, he tried um, to and, 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 and to his credit, yes, he did. You're right. He, he was trying to do too much. And to your credit, Georgia has to take advantage. Here's the thing. Um, Everyone was worried about this being a slow start and an ugly game for Georgia. I thought they would go out there and take care of business, and they did not. And, mm-hmm. and it starts to concern me about just how much you can rely on Carson Beck to win you games. Because in my opinion, uh, and, and it's not just on him. We're using him as a generalization for the entire offense. But last year, you got in tight games, and you knew you had Carson Beck, Brock Bowers, and Lad McConkey, and, and and if you needed a drive, you felt you could put one together. And I, I just don't have that feeling right now for this Georgia team. And I, I don't know if that's because the right playmakers haven't stepped up. Or I don't know if it's because I don't believe in Carson Beck. Um, and I'm not saying Carson Beck can't win a national championship or any of that stuff. But, like, I've never really seen Carson Beck as, like, one of the top two or three quarterbacks uh, heading into the NFL draft. Like, I, yeah. I just – I don't see it right now. Um, and, and certainly this game didn't do much to change my mind in that. Didn't do much to change my mind about whether he's a Heisman contender. Um, but look, at the end of the day, and I know you've said this more than anyone, uh, 
all that matters is you kept the, the, the clean sheet in terms mm -hmm. of that win loss record. Um, and, and, you know, we'll joke about this on, on the air on Monday, right? This is the best case scenario for Kirby smart, right? You get the win, but you also get to lay into your guys and, and uh, you know, shine some sunlight on some of the problems and all this. Um, they've also got to stay healthy. They, they had another bad rash of injuries in this one. Um, and, and we'll see. They, they have an off week coming. Uh, a lot of people like to believe that the off week could be a reason they'll they'll uh, struggle or, or kind of sleepwalk in this one. But um, they, they need to get right. They, they have, as you mentioned to me just before we started this podcast, the new AP yeah. poll came out. Um, they're not number one anymore in, in the AP poll. And, and I think this um, performance, rightfully so, has has made it that people are, are doubting them for the first time this season. I think it's fair to doubt them, but I also think uh, based on the talent on that roster, they could be as good as anyone. They just got to play their game and they didn't do that Saturday night. No. And, and I, I think that's, that's also a credit to them as well. I mean, in the game that you don't play your best, you still go on the road in the SEC and get a win. And, and maybe that's just recoloring it and reshaping it, uh, I guess, to make a, make a positive out of something like that. But mm -hmm. They did not look good. They were not consistent on offense, and, and really that's what it comes down to. You have to be more consistent on offense. Kentucky is not the – I mean, Kentucky is also a, a really good team. They're not a team – when you actually dive into the numbers and, and, and go back to what they did against South Carolina, South Carolina just took advantage of, of five turnovers, just fumbles, freak like freaks, freakish types of plays. South Carolina, when you actually looked at what happened in that box score, they did not beat Kentucky as bad as the score might have indicated. And then the game got out of control, and, and then um, that's just sort of what happens in football. But this is a pretty sound Kentucky Wildcat football team, but they are 0-2 to start the season You in the SEC. You have to start manufacturing ways to win games, and Kentucky damn near did that in this game. So you got to give Kentucky full credit. Jamon Dumas-Johnson and Brock Vandegrift, the two transfers, I thought they played really good football games in this game, but ultimately like this is a physical team. It's a very physical team and Georgia, even on their worst day, they still pull out a win and that's a credit to them, but you have a big test coming up and you said it honestly, and we are going to joke about that. It's going to be a very co consistent theme over the next two weeks. How, Oh wow. Now everyone's doubting them. This is the best thing that could have possibly happened to Kirby smart. He's going to use that. He's going to hear that. He's going to use it. And it's going to be fuel for this team over the next bye week and then subsequently into that the, probably the biggest game of the season to this point when Georgia travels to Tuscaloosa to take on the Crimson Tide. It, it is the best case scenario for the Georgia Bulldogs falling out of that number one spot because they won't be able to go back and get it next week, uh, barring just some cataclysmic event from Texas, which I don't foresee happening. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, like I, I thought ultimately this is a survive and advance type of scenario in the in, 2024, 2024 um, that this edition of the college football playoff, it's just win your games and you'll get your chance. Well, it just the other thing for me is that I was, as I was watching this game and I'm sitting there thinking like, if Georgia does end up losing, like at least it's not the end for them. And, and, yeah. and this is what I think I am going to appreciate more from this, this expanded playoff field is like, all right, they had a bad game on the road before a bye. They're college kids. It didn't work out. Like, if they had lost, um, the season's not over. They can still play their way into the seedings and, and, and through beat whoever's in front of them and, and still win a national championship potentially. And same thing goes if they're a, you know, lose at Alabama or lose against Texas. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see them make their way. But uh, the, the focus is still on the ultimate goal, win or lose. Mm -hmm. And now it's 42 consecutive wins for the Georgia Bulldogs in the regular season, which is just an incredible number. I mean, the last time you lost the regular season was 2020 against the university of Florida. It's crazy. And I was also doing this, and this is the last thing I'll say about this before we move on. Abe, do you know who the only active head coach to beat him in, or it's two active head coaches, two active head coaches. And it happened in the same year, I believe uh, who have beaten Kirby smart in the regular season. Do you know who they are? Uh, I'd have to sit and really think about it. It's Gus Malzahn when he was at Auburn. He's now okay. at UCF. And it's Hugh Freeze when he was at Ole Miss. And now he is at Auburn. Um, I had to go back through the, the – I had to dive all the way in. Because I was curious about it because you look at it. Because most of the teams – most of the coaches who beat him 
Um, Tom Herman, I don't believe is a head coach anymore. Um, or he might be somewhere. I'm not sure. He's not in the power five at least. Um, and then you have Nick Saban who's beaten him. He's obviously he's retired. You have, um, Dan Mullen. He's retired. Uh, Paul Johnson, he's retired. I mean, most of these guys aren't even in, aren't even coaching football anymore. It's just sort of a wild thing to think about. Just that run of dominance that Kirby Smart has had in the regular season is, is truthfully, it, it's something to behold. But something else, to, something to behold, or the Alabama Crimson Tide, what they did, went up to Madison, Wisconsin, and did to those poor Badgers. Oh, and this is exactly what we talked about, Abe. And you said you actually said it. You said that this this is a kind of game that they could drop fifty points and not blink. That's pretty much what happened. And when Tyler Van Dyke goes down on your opening drive, that is panic button for Wisconsin. He was going to be your only hope. He would have to play really the game of his life. And he started off pretty well. I mean, he, he, he completed all five of his first complete uh, first five attempts uh, before he goes down with the eventual injury. And he's seen on the sideline in a, in a, a boot uh, and, and on crutches. And so he wasn't obviously able to finish this game, but Alabama, when they jumped out to a lead, it was all she wrote. I believe it, I think it was like 17 to nothing or something at one point, and uh, it was over. It was over because Wisconsin, we talked about it on the preview show, they're not built to come back. And, I mean, Chesma Lucy, I mean, credit to him. I mean, he actually put together a pretty solid rushing day, but if you're not jumping over the 100-yard mark and, and consistently controlling the clock in this game and keeping that explosive Alabama offense off of the field, then you're really not doing yourself any favors. But Jalen Milrow, he looks really good. He did it with his legs in this one. He scores twice on the ground, 75 yards for him. But he also adds three more through the air, and he just pops that ball down the field. Ryan Williams is the truth. Man, that guy is explosive. He scores again in this game for Alabama. But they roll, and uh, all eyes are set on Tuscaloosa. In two weeks, both teams, Georgia and Alabama, with bye weeks going into uh, what should be one of the best matchups of the season. Yeah, for Alabama, um, when when they're outside of the red zone, Jalen Milrow will beat you with his arm. When they're inside the red zone, he beats you with his legs. Yeah. Um, and, and that's how he's gotten it done. Five touchdowns in this game. And, uh, yeah, Tyler Van Dyke, sure, he was 5-5, five of five, but for 16 yards. I mean, he's dumping off left and right there in this one. A. It wouldn't have mattered much either way. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 the one thing it showed you is that Alabama is, is potentially back to getting it done on both sides of the ball. There, there was yeah. a stretch there where it felt like, uh, even last year, it felt like it had to be Milrow outscoring you. Maybe not to the extent that, like, LSU and Jaden Daniels had to outscore you. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you maybe couldn't count on the defense quite the same as you had in years past. And it'd be interesting to see if they're getting back to that a little bit more uh, defensively uh, because they absolutely dominated this game. It, it was over a me, you know, not pretty close. I mean, and I agree in the first quarter when, when Van Dyke goes down, you're like, Oh, so it is over. Like they haven't even like pulled away, but it was over then. Um, but they, they go into halftime up 21, three, they, they come out of halftime and put two more touchdowns in the third quarter. And, and that was pretty much that. So very, very impressive performance for for Alabama, and like you mentioned, uh, they're now just getting set, getting ready uh, to welcome Georgia in. Uh, both teams are going to be on a bye this week, and and that is the first, um, but not last, uh, I guess, race for a um, uh, a bye. I mean, yeah. if you will, the winner of this, the loser is by, by no means eliminated, but the winner of this takes a huge step towards reaching the SEC title game and, and potentially getting a, a buy in the playoffs. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that one as we get there. But um, Alabama uh, looks very good. And, and quite frankly, when I when I really sit and think about it, um, Carson Beck has not been impressive. Quinn Ewers gets hurt, which we'll talk about. Um, Jalen Milrow probably is the front runner for the Heisman right now. Um, in, in my opinion, I know, I know Cam Ward's going to have to have some big games and, and the, the opponents are, are going to have to show up for him because he needs to have big moments, but, um, Jalen Milrow is just lighting it up. No one seems to be able to have an answer how to stop him. Yeah. It, it, I think George is going to have to have a very interesting game plan, uh, to take out Jalen Milrow. Because we saw what they what they were able to do in the SEC championship game last year, and I know you know for a fact that this that game was this game has been circled on the Georgia calendar uh, since it came out. I mean, you know that. I mean, everybody knows that. Uh, 
the way that they this team has attacked the the, the off season and then and subsequently the the early parts of the season. This game has been circled for Georgia for a long time. I mean, they're the reason that they didn't get a chance to, to three-peat. Um, and as you play one bad game, and that's all it is, and you mentioned that earlier in the program, I mean, they're going to have more of opportunities. And, and whoever wins that game, they're still the whoever loses that game is still going to have plenty of opportunities to, to make their way into this tournament. But look, Alabama can run the ball. I think that was the biggest thing. They were absent a solid rushing attack last and, year. And not just with Milrow, by the way. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. it's like you needed somebody other than Jalen Milrow to be able to run the ball. And I think you have that in Jam Miller. I really like Justice Haynes. I, I watched him when he was at Blessed Trinity and subsequently when he moved over to Buford. He is as talented a running back as there is on that roster. He only gets two carries in this game, which I, th- I found very interesting. But Jam Miller looked really good. Uh, they're spreading the ball around. And that's a scary fact, too. Because when Alabama is at their best, it's when they have several different guys who can hurt you in several different ways. You have big bodied guys. You have guys who can get shifty and move around. And that's when Alabama, I felt like when they were like the scariest versions of Alabama, they had a two back system where you had a thunder and lightning type. And it all, they always seemed to have somebody it was, it was Eddie Lacy and, and all these other guys. I mean, like these guys were just able to, to get after it. I mean, Mark Ingram and Eddie Lacy and like all those other dudes right? They had two guys and they would really punch you in the face. And that's kind of what they're returning to. Um, and that should be scary to everybody in college football. Anybody who doubted Kalen DeBoer, I don't know why anybody would do something like that. He has to replace a legend, but at the same time, the dude is pretty damn good himself. Let's move over here to the Palmetto state where South Carolina played one of the best games that I've seen them play. And they still aren't, and it's still just not enough. It's still just not enough. We talked about Lenore Selders potentially needing to play the game of his life. He gets hurt in this game. Robbie Ashford comes in instead. It was just not enough. It just was not enough. Rocket Sanders, though, does take up a lot of the appreciation posts for the South Carolina offense. He finally wakes up and finds some of that, uh, some of that offense, 143 yards, for the former Arkansas Razorback the, the who came in here through the transfer portal, he finally finds his way to a, a successful day on the stat sheet. But really, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's what you saw from this South Carolina defense. That front seven is filthy. The pass rush, what they were doing to Garrett Nussmeyer, what they've done to, to Brock Vandegrift last week, they are the truth. That combination of Kyle Kennard, uh, with Kyle, uh, Dil- Dylan Stewart and Kyle Cobb, K- K- Kyle Kennard, I cannot get his word, damn name out. Um, the former Georgia Tech Yellow Jacket. They are, they got quarterbacks and blenders, man. They got quarterbacks and blenders. Great performance from South Carolina, but also very resilient performance from LSU. They really needed this game, and they trailed big at one point. And they were in a, a, a raucous environment, a place that, uh, I mean, it's not an easy place to play over there at williams Bryce. But LSU, full credit to them. They come out here and steal a game from the Gamecocks. Yeah, uh, both teams tried to hand this one over to the other side uh, plenty of times. There were five total turnovers in this game. And, and you mentioned once Sellers went down, and he, he tried to come back in later, but at that point he wasn't running. Um, yeah. When when Ashford came in, they were pretty much just defending the run and not throwing. Um, and, and so South Carolina, after the injury to Sellers, it, it just their, their offense became – unbalanced one way or the other, whether it was Sellers in, they were going to throw. If it was Ashford in, they were going to run. Mm-hmm. And, and it made it a lot easier for LSU to kind of figure out a couple of things uh, defensively, and, and that helped them pull out ahead. I also want to give a shout-out here to Caden Durham, the freshman running back for LSU, who really provided this offense a shot in the arm and, and maybe feels like he is the mainstay now. He comes in with uh, 11 carries, 98 yards, two touchdowns. Um, and like hard carries, hard yards, yeah. like stuff that stuff that wore on the South Carolina front. And you mentioned just how good they were. Um, imagine how much it would be even worse if they weren't also having to defend run because they were pinning the ears back and getting after the quarterback. There's no doubt about that. They they were very impressive. And you were trying to figure out last week, right? Was it just Kentucky or are these guys really that good? they're really that good. And I was uh, very surprised the LSU offensive line could not hold up a little bit better than they did. But Caden Durham, um, 
kind of stepped to the forefront of this offense at a very important time for LSU yeah. when they were struggling to feel their way through this game in the early um, and middle parts of the second quarter. And then they finally stabilized. They get a lucky break on with some officiating decisions. Uh, and even though they got stopped at the goal line, four downs, because um, yeah. it could have been a much more comfortable victory and they decided mm-hmm. – uh, too easy if we score. So let's turn it over and see what happens. Um, but but you're right. Um, it is a good showing for South Carolina. And at the same time, I think it's a, a formidable, resilient. I think that's the word you used. It's a very yeah. good, apt word in this moment um, for LSU. Yeah, and and that was and you kind of hinted hinted at it. You you gave Caden Durham a lot of credit. I mean, and, and look, he deserves full credit for it. I mean, eight and a half or eight, almost nine yards per carry. Uh, for the young man in this game, but you can tell that they need a rushing attack. It kind of came on as the game went along. They were able to lean on South Carolina a little bit, and that's really how they were able to get that game going. But they need more from that room in early parts of games because not everybody is going to be – I mean, South Carolina, all due respect to South Carolina, you're going to have a lot more formidable teams on your schedule down the rest of the road. You cannot afford – to start that slowly against some of these guys. You just can't afford to do that. Um, But I will say this also about South Carolina. Last thing I'll say about this one before we move on. Uh, We've, we've talked a lot about the schedule that Florida has the last five games that they have on that schedule. How about what, what, what poor South Carolina has over their next couple of games, they get Akron in a, a, a layup game coming up next but then after that it's a bye week and then you dive into this unbelievably brutal stretch of games where you have Ole Miss at home that's the number five team in the country then you're at Alabama that's the number four team in America then you are at Oklahoma the number 15 team in America then you have Texas A&M in uh in Columbia that's the number 25 team in America then it's Vanderbilt a team that I mean they go on the road and lose to Georgia State but they already have some some big wins on their schedule so far this season But then it's Missouri, and you finish the year at Clemson. It is a tough slate here for the Gamecocks, and they need every single opportunity to win. This is one of those games that they're going to look back at this year, and if if maybe they're they're like right on the edge of winning seven games, if that's really what it comes down to, if they're on the edge of winning six, they're going to look back as as just what could have been in this game. Uh, But let's move into the other Columbia. This one out there in Missouri, the Tigers, they looked pretty good in this game. I will say Boston College also looks pretty strong in this game. They are definitely not a fluke. Boston College is not a fluke. Um, But look, Missouri passes its first test of the season. They get the 27-21 win. I'll just defer to you, Abe. What do you what did you see in this one? Yeah, I don't think they passed this test. I think they won the game, but I think they failed this test. Uh, it, when I look at the teams that they're it's a C. It's they passed the Yeah, I, I mean it just look, you're asking my honest opinion. They're, they they are need to be doing what Tennessee is doing. Um, and Tennessee beat the brakes off of NC State. And, and I like Boston College. I thought they got off to a great start, had a 14-3 lead. Missouri sees control, and then Missouri kind of kind of stumbled all over themselves. Uh, during the back uh, third of this game. Um, they needed to be more impressive, um, and they weren't. Uh, it, it wasn't anything bad. Like, their offense is fine. Their defense is fine. It's just not impressive enough to make me believe that they can do what Tennessee, Alabama, Texas, Ohio State, Georgia. Like- but they're built They're built differently. That, that's my thing. Th- this is no, what not, I, what I say. they got to win games. They, they're well, not they built to win those games. They're not. Okay. Like, like, like you, if you're competing and I know you can, I guess you could turn it around on me and say, well, Georgia barely beat Kentucky. If that's the way you want to go, then fine. But like Georgia also has pedigree. You We've need to be to dominating do. these squads. Boston college is good. They're fine, but they're not contending for anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, Missouri needed to be more impressive. That's all. Uh, look, you, you got the win and you'll have plenty of opportunities down the road to change my mind in SEC play, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but but right now, if you if you gave me a list of the teams that are ranked above Missouri, Tennessee, Ole Miss, Alabama, Texas, Ohio State, like I wouldn't take them to beat any of them, home or road. Hmm. I, I at least want to think about it. Like like at least Tennessee makes me think about it, right? 
Missouri doesn't make me think about it. And, and so it, it feels like, you know, it, I, I know we just had the Olympics a couple months ago and I'm going to use like the worst comparison here in the world. You know, when you have that elite group of runners at the front of the pack and there's like one or two people who are desperately trying to hang on to that lead pack yeah. and not fall behind into that chase group where the, the lead just grows and grows and grows. It feels like that's the runner Missouri is right now where they've got this elite group of runners and all of them can go gold, silver, bronze. And they're just trying to get in the photo at the finish. And I just don't know if they can hang on now again. That doesn't mean they can't change my mind down the road, but that that's how I view them right now. Yeah, no, I think that's completely fair. Um, and they're not going to have as many opportunities to really prove it, as you say, as some of the other teams will have this year. Uh, they have Texas A&M that, that they should absolutely win that game. It's a road contest for them, but it, I mean, you have Alabama, you have Oklahoma, but outside of that, you have a lot of games that you should absolutely win. And I don't know where, if they lose all three of those games, I still wouldn't know fully who this team is, but well on offense specifically, because they just need to be a little bit more dominant. So I understand where you're getting from. You're, you're going with that. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like you don't know who this team is just as far as the dominance is concerned. Uh, like what you saw late in the season from Missouri, what they did to Tennessee, that's what you're expecting. But I'm also looking at this team too. And, and this is a Boston college team that had, a very a firm identity of running the football and you shut them down in the running attack. They only finished this game with 49 rushing yards. Treshawn Ward, uh, he led them with 21 total yards on the ground. That is why I say that this is a past test because you know who Missouri is They're, They want to play stout defense. They want to dominate on the defensive line and they did. That's what they did in this game. You just need to see a little bit more consistency from that offense. I mean, Brady cook was fine in this game. Luther burden, uh, he goes over 100 yards. He has the touchdown, but it's like Nate Noel, he had a great game here too. But it's like you just need to see a little bit more of that consistency from this team. And it felt like they scored in bunches, but they were also stagnant for far too long in this game. So that's and that's really what I'm talking about with identity and, and, and trying to come together and, and piece it all together. You're not going to be able to piece things together against the likes of an Alabama. So that's where I agree with you. As far as like they might, they're a rung below. They're still clearly in that second tier of the SEC, despite the fact that they are the number six team in America. I, I don't see them as a legitimate contender in the SEC. I just don't. And they, and to to your point, they didn't pass that test. Be like, hey, I'm going to go be that uh, that next team. They did pass the test, in my opinion, of just win, and then you're going to get in eventually. You don't have to be sexy to win anymore. You just don't. If they can maintain that level and be that fourth, fifth best SEC team, that's going to be enough to get into the college football playoff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If that's what we're measuring and looking at, then that's I what totally, I'm saying. Yeah, then I totally agree with you, but I, I feel like this is a Missouri team that is begging to be treated the same way that we treat the five SEC teams above them. And I just can't it. do it. I you just, I, I can't do I it right now. Yeah, And they, they won't have as many offers. Opp- you get Alabama, you get Oklahoma, and you get Texas A&M. Those are the big ones. You got to go out and prove but, it again. But those. when we look at the schedule and we look at Tennessee and we see what they're doing, they haven't had that real SEC opportunity to prove it. But what they did to NC State, to me, proved it. And mm-hmm. and they obviously they threw up 65 points and a half yesterday. The, opponent or not, I mean, that's still impressive. That's an unbelievable number. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. 65 points is, or 65 points. That, that's, yeah. that, that is what it is. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you're playing. It doesn't matter who you're playing. Um, if, if anything, I, I'm starting to question uh, Tennessee being behind Ole Miss right now. And, and, and again, that'll sort itself out. And, you know, it they, they, sort of they may be, you know, the Spider-Man meme where they're they're the same. But, um, I mean, that, it, that that's how good they've been the past two weeks. Yeah. They've been as good as any team in the country. Uh, the well, UT, the other UT, uh, had some big news that just rolled. You like to see that little segue that I just did there? I just kind of made manufactured that one. Yeah, uh, you'll the have other to UT, learn we can't call both programs UT, so we can get <laughs> used to that. Nope. And the SEC has already named uh, Tennessee as UT. Uh, so the University of Texas, uh, they lose Quinn Ewers to an injury, and it's still to be determined what the outlook is for him. I saw that it was, I think you said it was an oblique. 
Uh, I had read that somewhere. You confirmed that. The an oblique injury is tricky. That's very tricky. We, I mean, we're Braves fans. We watched the Braves here. They that Sean Murphy, the catcher, um, he strains his oblique in the first game of the season. He misses upwards of a month and a half because of it. You just have no idea what's going to happen with this. I've seen people come back from oblique injuries in a week and been mostly fine. I've seen it go on and, and linger and stick around and hover and bother somebody. And they're very painful. And for a quarterback where you have all that twisting motion, that torque that you have to generate, this is a tough injury. But on the other hand, Arch Manning looked pretty damn good. He, the hype train is going to be in full effect. He finishes this game with 223 yards passing. He has four touchdowns. I understand you're playing UTSA. That's a pretty good UTSA team. That's not a, a slouch of a football team by any means. But how about the athleticism from Arch Manning? 53 yards on the ground. He has that one really long scamper that ends in six. You got to remember, his dad was the wide receiver in the family. Uh, Cooper Manning. Art, uh, Archie Manning had had some serious athleticism. Peyton Manning, he joked he was on with um, I think Pat McAfee at some point. And he says, "Yeah, it skipped a generation. All the athleticism, all the all the, the the speed and everything else." I'm like, "No, it's just all went to your brother Cooper." Uh, Peyton and Eli, of course, not very mobile necessarily. And that's not really what their calling card is. But Arch Manning, he looked pretty mobile in that one carry. But how big of a deal is it to you, Abe, that Quinn Ewers is down with an oblique injury? Yeah, I mean, I think it's all going to be about the timeline. And just a couple of minutes ago, Pete Thamel came out and said that the ab injury is not as serious as initially feared. He's going to miss okay, Louisiana good. Monroe this week, but he's listed as week to week. And and, and we'll see how that goes. And and um, the, the question is, and you may not want to, you know, if you're, if you're Quinn Ewers, you may want to turn this off real quick. But um, depending on how many weeks you're gone, and depending on what games you miss, is there a situation where you don't get that starting job back? Um, you, you've got back-to-back -back games here against Oklahoma and Georgia. Um, if he's not back for that and Arch Manning leads Texas to wins in those two games, I don't know if you give that job back. Um, you think he's getting Wally pipped? Are you making a change if... if um, if they beat Oklahoma neutral site and then, and then beat Georgia, like I'm not. I think you're also putting the cart in front of the horse right now. If, no, if I'm, put, I'm asking the question. I, yeah, I'm just asking. Sure. The theoretically. Question. Yeah, fine. They, they I mean, say he's going to be out this week. Um, they, they've got the Mississippi state game and, and then an off week. I mean, that gives him three full weeks of prep plus the, the game week leading into Oklahoma. So he's got a month right now to return from an injury that they are deeming as week to week and not as bad as initially feared. So, uh -huh. um, but the good news is it, cause it could have gone the other way and Arch Manning could have come in and the offense stalled and you're like, Oh my God, we're in a world of panic. Much better to have the issue of which great starting quarterback are we going to use as opposed to which bums tossing the ball around this day. Um, so uh, look, they, they, they ought to get, to Oklahoma game without any issues. And then we'll see from there if Quinn's back, if Arch is back, or, or, or what the, the conundrum is there. But um, very impressive for Arch to come in and with because you know the pressure is crazy, separate of just replacing oh, yeah. Quinn Ewers, but the pressure on him the to, name. Be, to be good um, at no, Texas. No, not be good. No, the pressure to be one of the greats. That's the well, they, I, let's just start with be good. Uh, it, he could be one of the greats down the road. I mean, in his in his yeah. first real action to just come in and not look like a disaster, but in fact, look like this offense didn't drop a beat and quite frankly, maybe gain something because of the legs that he has. Yeah. Um, it, it, very impressive for him to get in there and do what he did, as you mentioned, against the UTS 18. That's not great, but it's not uh, not an embarrassment no for a squad either. Yeah. I mean, when you finish a game, when both of your quarterbacks, the star quarterbacks that you have on your roster, they finish with more touchdown passes than they did in completions. Generally speaking, that's pretty good. You know, that, that's a pretty good mark. You know, uh, Arch Manning. I mean, so he came in here. He looked. He was he was solid. He was pretty solid here in this one. Um, another thing that's pretty solid. Rivalries. I love rivalry games. They're they are just so much fun. 
Um, they are really the epitome of what college football is all about. And let's start here in the Apple Cup where, where we had three of these that we're just going to talk about really quickly. Um, how about Wazoo, man? Will Rogers uh, for, for Washington, he plays pretty well. But this John Mateer, man, he is so up and down. He is so exciting to watch, I will say. He's just, th this team is just interesting when he is under center. He finishes the game with 300 total yards. He leads the team in rushing, has two touchdowns on the ground, also has 245 yards passing. And um, Wazoo wins this one, 24 to 19. Enacts him a little bit of revenge on their neighbors. Yeah, two things. You pointed out, John Mateer, ahead of this game. You were absolutely right. He's dynamic and, and really injects some energy and life into this offense. Washington had a fourth and one at the two or three yard line or, or right at the goal line, whatever it was. Um, one play call pretty much to win or lose mm -hmm. the game. And, and they go with a, a option pitch to the short side of the field. Uh, honestly, it's just a terrible play call. Um, it, it, it really is. Um, it was pathetic to watch um, that be the final play call. I, I wanted something where you give Will Rogers an option to run or pass, yeah. um, but to the short side of the field where it's too easy for the defense to string that one along, um, really, really poor play call. Uh, and that was disappointing to see the way that this game ended on something. You're like, oh, I can't believe they went out like that. It, it kind of uh -huh. felt that way a little bit for Washington. Yeah, how about Josh Jackson, too? 162 yards for the wide receiver and the touchdown. Um, counted for over half of Will Rogers' uh, total yards uh, passing in this game. But Jetfish, this is his first real opportunity. You talked a little. I mean, this was his first real opportunity to, to, to show what he can do over there in Washington. And, and I mean, it's just one of those things. It's just one of those things. And uh, he's got some rebuilding to do. They have some some pretty clear holes on that roster uh, over there at Washington, but Wazoo is going to be fun to watch this season. They're, it's going to be one of those boom bust teams that you got to have your television turned on to them whenever they're playing, because you really have no idea what they're going to be. It, 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 it just, it starts with that quarterback, man. He's just fun to watch. Uh, another game that also happened out there on the West coast um, in a completely different type of result, Oregon finally waking up. We, we talked about this, on the show last week, we talked about it on our college football show that we do on Sports Radio 19 on the game on Saturday. This felt like the game that they were going to wake up. It felt like it was trending. Like, they had the numbers. The numbers were saying they were a better football team. It just wasn't showing up on the scoreboard. Well, it showed up in a big way in this one. They beat Oregon State 49-14. Yeah, the big difference, and we talked about it, is, is Oregon had been begging to try and find a run game in the yeah. first two weeks. That, that was the biggest difference because it's not been about Dylan Gabriel. His efficiency, his accuracy, the yardage, everything's been on check for him. Mm -hmm. uh, but the run game had not been there to support. That changed on Saturday. They go for 240 yards, four touchdowns on the ground, one of those being accounted to Gabriel, who also tallied 64 yards. Um, that's the big difference for this Oregon offense. They did not have it the first two weeks. Uh, struggled to replace uh, uh, so, some of their guys on the ground last mm -hmm. year, but looked a lot better on Saturday. And, and 40 points, like in that group, that's that's right where Oregon normally seems like they are. So uh, they're back after it. Yeah, they're, they're the team that we expected them to be. Um, they, they were that team all along. And uh, I think everybody – it's one of those overreactions to things you see early in the season. It, no, they'll, they'll be fine. Dylan Gabriel, 84% completion percentage. That's got to I – mean, he's, he's, we talked about that one too. It's just he's going to be getting to that level where if he keeps passing and completing this many passes, my God. It's just – you just stay ahead of chains. When you're keep make, making completion after completion after completion after completion, that's how you just out – just, just, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the word demoralize an opponent. You just continuously make plays, and, and that's kind of what Oregon was able to do. But you nailed it, Jordan James on the ground. The rushing attack was really what stole this game. Uh, that's where they dominated. Uh, Tess Johnson also goes crazy in the wide receiver core. But, um, one more of these rivalry games that I do want to mention before we hit to our, our week three shout outs. Uh, the Pitt Panthers. They survive at the buzzer. They win 38-34 over West Virginia. They get an interception to lock it all down. Eli Holstein finishes this game with three touchdowns and 300 yards passing. Uh, I was a little surprised, though, 
neither of these rushing attacks really took off. I mean, West Virginia was they were they're good. They go for 188 in this game, but I was a little surprised that Pitt doesn't even hit that the century mark in this game. But um, Abe, what are your thoughts on this one? Well, look, this is the second straight week where Pitt kind of had to furiously rally to find a victory. Uh, we know they came from down what 21 or 24, whatever the number was, against Cincinnati yeah. a week ago. Um, they're down 10 points like late in the fourth quarter in this one. They score with three minutes and six seconds left, one touchdown, and then the go-ahead touchdown, they score with 32 seconds left. So they scored two touchdowns in the final three minutes, 10 seconds of this game to surge past uh, West Virginia for the win. It's just uh, um, just, just kind of a never – you know, they're, they're, they're the Michael Myers of uh, college football right now. They just, they just can't be killed at the moment. Uh, no matter how often you put them down, they, they keep <laughs> getting back up and coming after you. Um, now, obviously they're not going to do that against a, a little bit better competition, but it's been fun to see the fight that the pit team has. And we talked about that before, like, like mm-hmm. you saw it in the Cincinnati win and uh, it, it did showcase itself in an important way here in this one as well. Yeah. And they, they, and look, it's better to survive and, 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 and go back and, and recoup and, uh, and talk about things after a win, certainly than it is uh, to do so in the loss. Hey, what are your week three shout outs, man? Let's, go, let's jump right into this. Yeah. I want to, I want to holler at Toledo. Uh, they moved to three and oh by walking into sec country, albeit Mississippi state. Uh, and they, they straight up throttle them Garrett. Like, like they, they beat the Mississippi state 41 to 17 uh let, let me repeat that again toledo walked into mississippi state and won the game 41 to 17 you had tucker gleason with three touchdowns in the air uh only five incompletions on the day mm-hmm. um and it, it was just like one of those like am i am i is there someone have a typo on the espn score bug like what's going on here um, no, that was real, and, and they deserve the credit. I, I know Mississippi State is kind of right in there with Vanderbilt among the worst teams in the SEC, but, um, man, you take it to an SEC team like that in their house, you, you're you getting shouted out. There's no doubt. Yeah, and, and I want to give a shout-out to the Texas Longhorns, not because of the, the game that they played and Arch Manning doing what he did, uh, but it's because they're the now the number one team in America. They just passed the Georgia Bulldogs. There, Georgia still got a bunch of votes. Ohio State also got some votes. They rounded out at, at number three. Uh, I think it was like 35, 25, and three or something like that as far as votes go. Not important. What is important, uh, Georgia's not the number one team in America right now, which take that for what you will. doesn't mean a whole lot. They actually meet on the field this year, so um, they'll have opportunities to prove it on the football field. But uh, we talked about it when we talked about Georgia. This is the best-case scenario for Kirby Smart. Going into a bye week, you lo- you win the game that you're supposed to win, you don't do it pretty, and you lose that number one poll, number one ranking. People are doubting you. This is the best case scenario for the Georgia Bulldogs going into a, a, a huge matchup against Alabama. But I will say this as well. The SEC and their run of dominance in the AP poll just continues. Uh, they added another team. Texas A&M jumps into that 25 spot. They're back in the top 25. They now have nine total teams. Eight of them are in the top 16. Eight of them, Abe, are in the top six. Uh, where where'd my Gators come in, Garrett? Do you uh, I don't do you see I think, them? I, I don't I don't see them. Did you check um, the receiving votes? Are they listed there? No. <laughs> you sure? But the craziest fact of the matter is, Abe, six of the top seven teams are in the SEC, in the AP poll. Six of the top seven. The only other well, team and- is Ohio State. And it's not like this like crazy group of favoritism either. Like, like no. I mentioned my concerns about Missouri and them kind of notwithstanding, like who else would you jump like Miami or Oregon? I, I, I mean, like Penn state, USC, Utah, like it's not like just some crazy one-sided thing. Like they're deserving of being there. It's, it's pretty yeah. straightforward. I, I, my biggest question though, and then also, I do want to say this. This is the first time that Texas has been the number one team in America in 16 years. Been a long time coming here for the Texas Longhorns. But uh, you, we mentioned it when we talked about Tennessee and, and, and Missouri. I'm not fully convinced that, that Tennessee's not better than Missouri is right now. I, I don't know why that Missouri would be ranked ahead of them, but I, I guess you just hold serve and and you sit them right, right where they, they are. But look, it's, it is what it is. You, I mean, you've got the SEC. They've just continued the run of dominance in the AP poll. Uh, the Big Ten also has seven teams in here. 
uh, 3, 9, 10, 11, 18, 20, 22, and 24. It, it, those two conferences are just so far and above uh, the best two in America. And then the SEC is just in a league of its own. Uh, but I did want to mention that the AP poll does come out. None of it really matters, really, ultimately, because you get our college football playoff rankings that come out uh, coming up here in just a couple of weeks. We're, we're getting very close to that. And Abe, what do you say in a couple of weeks, we're going to give our, or maybe we'll do this on uh, when we do our next podcast. Let's just make a note of this. I want us to, to go through and rank our college football playoff top 12 teams. I want to do Ugh, 12? 12 teams, 12 teams. Or, or we got to wait at least one more week. Let, let's wait till, let's wait till we get okay. the, uh, who, who, yeah, we, we, we got no games. 12 teams. teams are on buys next week. Okay. Let's get at least four games in. All right. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. We'll, we'll do that. And then I need once someone we get to that, do it for me so I can plagiarize their work. I'm not, <laughs> not putting you my own react work. to it. You just don't want to, you don't want to be susceptible to the, the criticism, man. I can oh, tell you wow. where Missouri's going to be. Man, buddy. We'll see. All right. Been a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Mr. Gordon. If you're following along, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, make sure you follow along all season long. We are college football overtime. Uh, we do this twice a week. So, why not just follow along? We're having some fun. If you're still listening, thank you so much. My name is Garrett Chapman. His name is Abe Gordon. Uh, we will see you again here very soon. We are College Football Overtime. See?